time right now. Let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to today's virtual Tech Talk series. I'm Wei, I'm from Machine Learning Ecosystem from ARM. I will be your moderator for today's session. So today we have our ecosystem partner, Fluent AI, to talk about speech recognition on ARM Cortex-M microcontrollers. Let's first have a quick preview of our virtual Tech Talk agenda. In the coming months, we will have presentations to cover development on ARM, CPU, GPU, and NPUs and why synthetic data is important for AI data innovation. I also have another quick announcement today about ARM Dev Summit. So ARM's annual anchor event, ARM Dev Summit, will take place online between October 6th uh, to 8th this year. The conference will feature eight technical tracks and 12 workshops. In the AI track specifically, Google TensorFlow Lite, AWS SageMaker Neo, Facebook PyTorch mobile team will present, and our valuable ecosystem partners will be there as well. All technical sessions will be free to participate. So if you're interested, please use the URL here to register. Specifically, if you register before August 10th, registrants will also get a 24-hour advanced access to workshop signups. As our workshops have very limited spaces, I believe they will go quickly. Now let's have a little icebreaker with our speakers today. Hi, Van Kent, or probably I should call you Dr. Van Kent. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, I know you're the founder and the CTO of Fluent AI. Your, ma your work must keep you busy all the time. Just putting your work aside, what do you like to do in your spare time? Yeah, so definitely work is uh, all the time, it doesn't, doesn't stop. But uh, whenever I get a little bit of opportunity, I uh, do uh, play some sports, uh, tennis these days uh, because of uh, a summer time here in Montreal is very limited, so you would take advantage of that. And also Corona times, it's very safe to play tennis. Uh, mm -hmm. And then al I also like nature quite a bit. So I go for walks, long walks often, and I uh, go hiking, uh, camping as well. Those are also my some of my favorite activities to do. Great. I know you started Fluent AI a couple of years ago. So what's the motivation behind this? So I've been uh, working in the speech area for about uh, 12 years now, uh, like started back then in my undergrad. And really one of the things that I, uh, so undergrad, PhD, I worked at other companies like Nuance and uh, some others in, the, in this area. And one of the main issues that I saw that there were most of the speech recognition uh, technologies out there were only focused on handful of languages or they were limited in terms of the number of languages they could address. So that, is, that has been one of the key motivators behind Fluent to design this next generation of speech recognition technology that could really work in uh, any language. Because there's a lot of people around the world that cannot benefit from the current generation of speech recognition technologies, right? So beyond, let's say, some North American market and maybe uh, uh, some uh, presence in China and some other uh, major languages, there's a large part of the world that does not benefit from these technologies. And that is one of the uh, areas where uh, fluent technology is trying, and that has been the motivator. Yeah. Great, awesome. Uh, our co-presenter today is Sam. Sam, welcome. Uh, I learned you are a quite accomplished musician. So tell us about your music passion and how is this related to your career in fluent? Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I played trombone and keyboard. Uh, actually, when I was younger, in fact, I, I toured in a, in a band uh, across Canada and U.S. for a couple of years. Uh, and then I, I, I went and ended up, I, I studied, I did my master's doing uh, signal processing uh, for music. So I was trying to be able to isolate a, a melody and a piece of music. So I wrote a program to do that. And that led me to be interested in speech because it's, you know, the same audio uh, principles apply. Uh, and yeah, so I guess from that side, I've gone to uh, doing speech recognition. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, now I hope our audience get to know our speakers better. 
let's move on to the presentation. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A window to raise questions. The recording of today's session will be posted to our YouTube channel shortly afterwards. Okay, Rankhand, the virtual floor is yours. All right, thank you, Wei. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is uh, Vikrant, uh, founder and CTO here at Fluent. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to present to you all and thank you for being there, uh, listening, tuning in virtually. Uh, the today's slide is divided in three major parts. Uh, First, I'll talk briefly about Fluent AI, who we are, what we are about, give some examples of our products and some quick demos. Uh, then we will dive a little bit deeper into Fluent AI MicroCore, which is our on-device inference, uh, neural network inference uh, library. Um, my colleague Sam here will dive into techni uh, the technical details as well as some uh, examples of the implementations. And then we have a few other demos towards the end of the uh, presentation. But as we said, please feel free to ask the questions during uh, the, uh, using the Q&A uh, window during the presentation as and when they arise. So Fluent AI as a company, we started in uh, 2015 um, and the, the technology behind the company in fact is many years older than that. So it started with seven years of research in a consortium of uh, different universities. And the motivation really was to come up with a different way of doing speech recognition to address the problem of a different, a, like only handful of languages being able, uh, being addressed by the current speech, current generation of speech recognition technologies. Uh, and also that most of the then generation speech recognition technologies were uh, reliant on cloud uh, processing because they required very heavy, very heavy compute power. So Fluentia is all about bringing speech recognition to everybody. Uh, we are a small company, uh, about 25 people. Uh, team consists of a number of scientists, engineers, sales staff, and executives. Uh, the, despite being a small company, we have a number of partnerships with various research universities around the world. Pretty much all of them here in Montreal, as well as uh, many in uh, US, Europe, as well as Toronto. We we have our in terms of our customer base, we have presence in North America, Europe, and Asia. One of our key strength as a company is uh, that we have been uh, we are able to do speech recognition in any language, really, or in fact, even in multiple languages at the same time. So this has been a key factor in bringing uh, uh, customers to us from non-native, non-North American, or non-English markets. Right. So we have this is why we have a lot of interest in. Uh, in Asia. So Fluent AI as a technology is uh, very different from conventional uh, uh, speech recognition. And this slide summarizes that, right? So if you look at conventional technologies, it's typically a two-step process. You go from speech to text using your large neural networks that are typically cloud resident. So some examples of those would be uh, Google Assistant or Amazon Alexa, where most of the uh, uh, processing happens in the cloud. And then the second step is a, in these models is a natural language processing engine that takes that text output of the first stage and extracts meaning to uh, predict what the intent of the user was, right? So this is speech to text is also called ASR and then NLP natural language processing eventually results in uh, the intent identified and the action being performed on the device. And this is, this is true even if, let's say you have to turn on your lights in the living room, often with these virtual assistants, the data routes through some sort of cloud server, comes back to your living room device, and then the action is performed. At Fluent AI, we rethought this process. We're like, if you look at humans, how human do speech recognition, we don't really transcribe speech to text before understanding it. One example of that is kids. Before they start going to school, they can, before they can read and write, they can still understand speech. So the transcription seems to be for humans a separate process than understanding speech. So motivated by that, we created a set of technologies that we refer to as end-to-end -end spoken language understanding. And the motivation, this motivation allowed us to design a neural network that is able to not only directly take the uh, 
speech as input, but extract meaning directly from that, uh, that speech without having to convert it to text. There are a number of advantages of this approach. One of them is that the training data needs are very small compared to the conventional ASR plus NLU approach. The other thing is that we are able to design models that are much more compact. Uh, so we are now able to run very, very capable models on very low platform, very low power devices. And this is uh, what this part of the presentation is about, that we are able to run um, multiple wake words as well as uh, hundreds of intents on a very low power Cortex-M uh, Cortex microcontroller. The other advantage of our technology is that brings in is something very unique, which is personalization or learning from the end user. So you bring home a device, let's say it recognizes hundreds of commands, uh, but you want to change one of the commands. For example, my mother tongue is Hindi. I bring home a device in English. Maybe I want to say some of the commands in Hindi. So I can directly give that feedback uh, on the device and it will learn even in a different language and then start recognizing that. So that is a very unique aspect of our technology. And it is only possible by using this end-to-end -end spoken language understanding paradigm uh, that we uh, invented here at Fluent. The other advantage that you probably got a hint from here is that the system are able to recognize multiple languages at the same time. So it could be a single system uh, and you could go and speak to it in one of the two or three different languages that the system has been trained on. It does not need to be two, three different models. It's a single model recognizing all these languages concurrently. Um, and we have some demos that are recognizing English plus Mandarin plus Korean, three very different languages in the same model. Uh, and one of the demos you will show today also speaks to this uh, effect. So overall, where Fluent Shine is what, or what we call our right to win in business terms is low platforms, uh, low power platforms. So like microcontrollers or in terms of use cases like wearable devices, smart home appliances, things like that. Scenarios where you may have uh, uh, noise or require far field uh, where the microphone is not close to the speaker, but maybe three to six, uh, three to six feet away from the speaker in those sort of scenarios. Uh, that's also part of our right to win. And then really multilingual scenarios where, uh, where a user or these or a group of users could speak more than one language is. And in today's world, that's really where most of us are heading, right? Most of the people speak more than one languages. So the here on the right hand side is the, uh, is a quote by one of our uh, advisor and investor, William Tinsterpedo. William is an interesting individual. He's very well known in the uh, voice recognition uh, community as the founder of EV that was acquired by Amazon to eventually uh, uh, became a, uh, Amazon Alexa. And in Williams' uh, own words, Fluent's unique models, uh, the speech to intent models, they can be trained quickly. They can address the issues related to accuracy in different dialects, languages, and noise com conditions. And they can be embedded in small devices around the world. So that's our right to win. In terms of our products, we have two main lines of products. One is Fluent AI Wake Word, which is also known as sometimes trigger word or wake phrase. So you have a smart device at home, you want to use it for hands-free operations, but the device needs to know somehow uh, that you're talking to the device, right? So this is a word that wakes up the device. So one example, because now uh, the, uh, the prevalence of Amazon Alexa, Alexa is a one good example of wake word, but there are many other examples that represent different uh, brands uh, for, uh, for wake word. Uh, so on, on Fluent AI, in Fluent AI, we've done a lot of work uh, on the wake word side. So the single wake word where the device is always listening for one particular word, that's, that's one example of it. But we've also done work in multiple wake words as well as user trainable or user defined wake words. So multiple wake words is where the device could be listening for two, uh, two or three wake words in parallel at the same time. So this, this enables different kinds of use cases where uh, maybe you want to have two different uh, voice virtual voice assistants in parallel, or uh, the, uh, it might be that we want to, the use case requires listening for, let's say in an industrial IoT scenario, you may want to have some set of voice commands, but at the same time, you may want to have some emergency uh, words like help, and then how suddenly the system should be always listening for help and it suddenly stops uh, something. So that's one example. Uh, so where multiple uh, wake word could be very useful. 
And then user trainable wakeword is that instead of having everybody have to call their device Alexa or Google, uh, you could change the, the end user could change the uh, wake word of the device just by giving some examples. User trainable wake word is a uh, product, it's an in development product for us right now, but it works uh, very well. Um, in terms of the size of these models, the table here at the bottom actually summarizes how small we can be in terms of uh, footprint. These are running on an ARM. These numbers are uh, taken when we have a three wake word system running on an ARM Cortex M4 uh, series of microprocessor. Our RAM requirement is only about 25 kilobyte. We are able to run on MCUs running as low as 48 megahertz and with uh, in some cases even lower. Um, and the latency is very small, so it feels very instant. Uh, I have a quick demo here to show on one of our uh, partners board. Uh, this is a board from NXP, uh, runs ARM Cortex M33, which is next generation from the uh, M4. And it, this microcontroller is running at uh, uh, 150 megahertz. And I have it here. It has three different uh, wake words running uh, right now on, on this, uh, on this uh, board. So I'll bring it up uh, and Alex, please uh, put my uh, screen in uh, Zoom. So this is the NXP board and uh, I am going to switch to uh, a different microphone so that you can hear the uh, audio that goes into the board. Uh, this is just a power supply and the, the uh, input to the board. It has a, uh, uh, it has a LED that flashes every time it detects a wake word and it detects uh, three different uh, wake words. Uh, uh. Alexa, computer, Alexa. Hey Google, computer, Alexa. Abracadabra, la la la, Alexa. Computer, computer, hey Google, Alexa. As you saw, the, the response of the uh, system is very quick. As soon as it hears the wake word, it, it, it fires. Um, and this is running a, a ARM Cortex M33, as I said earlier. So the other, our, uh, other uh, product is what we call Fluent AI, AIR. AIR, automatic, it's AIR stands for Automatic Intent Recognition. So this is what we talked about, our direct speech to intent on device speech recognition system. Uh, so it's very unique uh, in how it is able to directly extract meaning or the, the keywords from the incoming speech. Uh, and it enables a number of use cases and running at very, very low power uh, with very, very high capabilities. The unique aspects of this, the, our models is that they are able to, we are very quickly able to train them in any language or accents. And in fact, they are able to recognize multiple languages at the same time uh, as well. The advantage here obviously for our customers, uh, our customers are mainly OEMs and ODMs device manufacturers that bring these technologies uh, to market through their devices. And the advantages for them is the very low development cost uh, because we, instead of having different SKUs for different markets, now they can just have the uh, same single SKU and address 10, 12 different languages in that. Uh, and also our quick development times also enables faster time to market. The table here at the bottom, again, it's been uh, uh, spec'd on a Cortex M4. Uh, and this is a system running also against three parallel backwards as I showed in the demo earlier and uh, running uh, uh, three parallel backwards as well as up to 50 different intents. I think the, I have, uh, a demo here that my colleague Sam will show in a moment that has English and Korean in, in that one. It's a smart home demo. Uh, but 
the, the RAM requirements for up to 100 intent is only 100 kilobyte. Storage requirement is up to 550 kilobyte. And this can also run on a, a, an MCU that is only running at up to uh, at 48 megahertz. So here is, uh, I, will I will have uh, my colleague Sam's video come into the focus for now. That is, he'll show you some of the uh, key demos here. Yeah, uh, so this is, this here is the, uh, it's, this is a SDM32 board. It's, it's running a ARM uh, Cortex-M4 uh, processor. And uh, I have a demo. So the demo we have here, it's, it's meant to represent sort of a smart home situation where you have, uh, you know, you can turn on and off the lights, turn on and off TV, Wi-Fi, uh, raise and lower temperature. Uh, and it has a, so this is a board that's running at, around 96 megahertz. Uh, and so what, what I'm going to do, is I'm going to give some, I'm going to say a wake word and then say a command. And uh, when I say the wake word, it should light up here. And then when I say the command, it should uh, change the graphics according to what the command is. So, um, so I can say, computer, turn on the television. Computer, lower temperature. Now, now this, this demo, in fact, it's, uh, it's multilingual. So uh, it, it actually has uh, English and Korean. Uh, I, I don't speak Korean, but I can get, try to say some, uh, some commands in Korean. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to say, uh, turn off the lights in Korean and should hopefully uh, respond. Say, computer, zungtun tata juo. So that's, uh, that's a demo, and I guess we can go back to uh, the rest of the talk. Oh, cool. thank you, Sam. Uh, so uh, as you saw, this was a very interesting demo. Uh, it's running on a uh, Cortex-M4 that's running at uh, 100 megahertz. It's able to recognize three parallel wake words and 15 tenths on device in two languages, and all of that in real time. And Sam is a, despite not being a Korean speaker, is able to... Uh, speak some Korean commands and the system responds. That also shows our uh, robustness uh, against uh, accent uh, or difference in different accents when uh, different users uh, tend to use the models. So that's our, uh, that's combination of our multi wake word and uh, AIR system on the device. It's a longer demo is available on this link uh, if uh, you, anybody wants to watch later. So uh, the next is, uh, as a company, what are we doing in giving back to community? Despite being a very small uh, company, we are actually fair, fairly active in contributing back to the speech recognition community. And two prime examples of these are Fluent Speech Command Dataset and the Speech Brain Project. Uh, Fluent Speech Command Dataset is a open research dataset that Fluent AI released uh, sometime last year. It has been downloaded over 500 times and I think it has been cited in over 40 papers. A number of researchers have been using this actively to do research in the spoken language understanding area. The Speech Brain Project is a very interesting PyTorch based next generation speech toolkit. It's spearheaded by Mila, and Fluent AI is an active contributor in that project as well. So, next to talk about Fluent AI microcore. So how do we basically take these capable neural network models and put them on these small devices and still manage to run them in real time? That's all covered, or this whole magic is covered by Fluent AI Microcore. And I invite Sam to take over now and talk in more technical details about what Microcore is, how do we take care of a number of uh, cases in there. Sam, there you are. I'm just going to uh, share my screen here. Yeah, so I'm, uh, so thank you, Vikrant. Uh, so I'm Sam, I'm, I'm uh, the lead machine learning developer at Fluent.ai and I want to talk, first of all, give a description of uh, just uh, Fluent.ai Microcore, what, what it is and what it does. 
uh, how we how we take uh, how we take these models and, and that we uh, train and, and put them on a device. And also, uh, I want to talk about some of the challenges of uh, dealing with real-time audio and, uh, and why we sort of built our own uh, library working on top of uh, uh, RMCMSYS uh, to, to solve these challenges. So first of all, the, the Fluent AI Microcore, uh, it's, a, it's a speech recognition system low, for low resource speech recognition system. And it's meant to detect the, a wake phrase uh, and and the command as as you saw in, in the demos. Uh, so the way it works essentially is uh, we're always listening for the wake phrase. So we have as the audio comes in, we do perform feature extraction, and then we send it to a, a neural network to to uh, decode whether the wake phrase is is detected or not. If it is, then it goes into intent detection mode. And in this mode, the features instead of being sent to the wake phrase neural network, they get sent to the uh, to intent detection neural network, and this out, and then it once the user is done speaking with their command, it will output a, a description of uh, of what the user intended to do. For example, like turn off the lights. Um, so yeah, as, as I said, we're we're going to uh, uh, sort of talk about how how the microcore is uh, is doing real time processing, and. Uh, uh, how it works, this works on uh, how we build our library on top of ARM CMSYS. Uh, so first of all, um, we have, uh, so we train our models on the GPU. Uh, there's various frameworks to do this. We, we happen to use PyTorch, uh, but then we have these models that are trained on the GPU and we need to get them to run on the, on the microcontroller. So uh, we have a program uh, we call a transformer, which uh, takes, takes these models and, and and makes it uh, compiles them into machine code, so that it can be run run on the controller. Uh, so there, there's a few steps to this this process. So the first step is to uh, do some post processing on the models. So this this is some of it to make more efficient. Like for example, uh, we fold batch normalization layers into, into uh, convolutional layers, or we can do uh, uh, eight bit quantization in order to reduce the the size and the footprint of, of the model. Uh, we reorder some of the weights in memory to make it more efficient to load into memory and to do computation uh, with those weights in, in, in the assembly instructions. Uh, second of all, uh, we, then we generate uh, a C++ code file. And this is, this is code which describes all the, the layers and the weights used in the model. And then this, this C++ uh, file, this model file is uh, compiled along with our library code and, and it generates uh, uh, machine code uh, library, which can be integrated into an application, which you can put on the device uh, to do whatever you want it to do. Uh, and one of the, one of the um, sort of crucial things in, in this uh, C++ code file is that it has uh, include statements uh, in order to import only the, the operations that are needed to run the model and only the parts of the code needed to run the model. And this, this uh, reduces the, uh, the eventual code binary size. Now, now, when we do speech recognition, we're, we're doing a real-time processing of real-time audio. And there's some differences between when you're training a, a speech recognition model and when you're running it on the microcontroller. So when you're training it, uh, you have the, the entire utterance is always available of what you're saying. Uh, but when you're running it on, on the device, you receive the audio uh, one frame at a time. So it's being streamed in. And on, on the microcontroller, when it's being used, you, know, you want to have a good user experience. You want to minimize the latency. So that's, in other words, when the user uh, speaks the command, you want to have the system respond as fast as possible. You want to have a minimal delay from when the user speaks and when the system responds to what they speak. But this is not a consideration when you're doing training, but it's important consideration on when you're doing inference. Um, when you're doing training, uh, typically your, your training examples, they have finite length. So you have utterances of, of finite length, uh, often, often all fixed in the same length. But when you're, when you're running uh, inference you know, it's, and you're doing wake word detection, it's continuously listening. So your, your, uh, your audio, is, it's not, uh, it's not, there's not a finite length. So the way usually in traditional systems, the way you deal with this is you, you're continuously doing inference on, on the model. At, you're giving it a, you know, a certain uh, amount of uh, duration at a time, and you're, and you're applying this, this inference in overlapping windows. So at, at a certain period, you keep doing 
inference. Uh, but the, the problem with this is that it, it, it can result in some redundant calculations. Um, also, when you're doing training on GPUs, uh, you typically have, you have a lot of resources. So you have uh, you know, gigabytes of memory, for example. Um, so, but when you're running on a microcontroller, uh, you need to, uh, need to minimize not only CPU usage, but also memory usage. And so the algorithms which are designed for, uh, for GPUs, which, which are meant to uh, speed up uh, training, but not, they're not really meant to optimize memory use. They're not always the, the most optimal, optimal algorithms to use when you're uh, running on a, on a device, on a microcontroller. Now, th there's one uh, sort of one algorithm that's, that's sort of meant to solve some of these problems in dealing with time series data is uh, recurrent layers, um, specifically unidirectional recurrent layers. Uh, the disadvantage of, of using uh, recurrent layers, though, is that uh, they tend to be uh, larger in size than convolutional layers. Um, so convolutional layers are more efficient, but in the existing libraries, they're generally designed for images where you have the entire image uh, you know, at, at once, and they're not designed so much for time series. So our solution to this, we want to build a, a streaming uh, neural network processor. So it, it's it, it's continuously decoding uh, streaming input. And so we built various streaming layer types. So you have, as I mentioned, you have the unir unidirectional recurrent layers, the GRU and LSTM. Uh, also, we have streaming convolutional layers, including depth-wise separable layers. Uh, we can do window functions like max pool. We can do so cumulative functions or, or reduction functions like uh, global max. Uh, we can do skip connections, which introduces sort of when you're doing it in time series, it introduces a delay, and also various activation functions. So the structure of how we do this in the code is that each layer is uh, represented as, as an object with uh, three main components. So first of all, you have the weights, which are stored in read-only as read-only data, and on the on the ARM microcontrollers, read-only data it's it's stored in on flash, and it it'll, it fetches it sort of as it's being as you're executing it. So as, as you need the data, it fetches it into the, the processor. Uh, so you, can, you, can, you don't need to store it all in RAM, but you can uh, fetch it layer by layer. Uh, and then we have an, uh, an activation buffer, which this is stored in, entirely in RAM, which is pre-allocated and stored in RAM. This is where we keep uh, activations. And then our process function, what it does, it takes one input frame uh, at a time. So instead of taking a whole utterance as input, you only, give it one, one time frame of input at, at a time, and it, it outputs one frame of input or, or no frames sometimes. Uh, and the process function underlying it, it's, it calls uh, this, the ARM CMSYS neural network library to do the uh, mathematical operations in, in a way that's sort of optimized in assembly for ARM processors. Hey, Sam, before you move on, uh, we have some questions yeah. from the audience sure. if you can help to address. So sure. what's the footprint of your microcore uh, library? So uh, the footprint of the, of the library, it, it depends on, on the model that, that because, we, mm -hmm. because we import different, you know, different operations and, and different weights for different models, it depends on, on the model. But uh, uh, in terms of in terms of uh, the flash size, I think I think we were typically in range of like around 500 500k of flash, or that's for that's for a wake word and intent. And if it's if it's wake word only, then maybe around it's less than that, uh, maybe around 350k. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so. So when you're running a whole a whole neural network, uh, we have um, these layers. These layer objects are sort of joined together in sequence. So when you receive an input frame, uh, it gets sent. You know, each each layer is uh, it functions independently, but when you receive an in input frame, it it sort of propagates through a network, and you receive uh, one frame of output at the end. And uh, I want to give. Uh, so I, I want to give a, maybe a, a more concrete example, a more specific example. So just to give a, a sort of uh, a better idea of, of how exactly this works. So this is a this is representing this diagram represents a, a streaming convolutional layer. 
with a kernel size of three in the time dimension and a stride of two in the time dimension. Uh, so what happens at time t equals one, we receive a frame of input. What we do is we put this frame of input into this activation buffer. Now, since we have a kernel size of three, uh, we don't yet have enough data to actually do any processing. So the output in this case is null. Now at time two, we receive another frame of input. This also gets put in the activation buffer, but the same thing, we don't have enough data yet to do processing. Uh, at time three, uh, now our activation buffer is full. Uh, so now what we do, the process function, it calls uh, the relevant function in CMSYS to, uh, to do computation on, on, this, uh, on this buffer. And then what we receive, uh, what we get is a frame of output. And this, this, gets, uh, this gets output one, one frame. Uh, also at the same time, what we do is uh, then we sort of shift the activations back by two frames. Uh, two frames here because stride is, is two. And then uh, the next frame, we receive another uh, frame of input and the cycle continues. Now, the crucial thing about this is that um, in the activation buffer, we don't store the entire utterance, but we only have to store here uh, a width of, of three, three frames because uh, the width here is the same as the, the kernel size. So we only need to store, a, yeah, we only need to store an activation width, which is equal to the size of the kernel. Uh, and the result of this is that because we don't need to keep the features and activations for the entire utterance, it requires, it, it results in much less uh, memory usage. Uh, also, because we're, we're processing in a streaming way, we're not waiting for the user to finish speaking before processing. Uh, this results in, in lower latency, so it's a faster response time. And also, this method, it doesn't, re it doesn't require uh, applying, uh, doing inference in, in uh, overlapping windows. It's sort of constantly doing inference. So this, this uh, eliminates redundant calculations by not having to use overlapping windows and that in turn results in lower CPU usage. Uh, now we did some benchmarks of, of our micro core versus uh, TensorFlow Lite uh, micro running on the, for microcontrollers. The model that we used is uh, our, our wakeward model, which is a, it's a convolutional model quantized for uh, the eight bits and it's uh, it's about 150K in, in size, this model. Uh, and so our, using this model, our microcore, it, it gives, a, it gives a, an output, it gives a response every 80 milliseconds. So what we did, we, we took the TensorFlow Lite micro model and we did inference at, at an interval of every 80 milliseconds. Um, this, this results in like very high CPU usage. So for a more realistic scenario, we also did a second, uh, a second test where we, we did inference only every 100 milliseconds. Uh, now, when we do every 400 milliseconds, uh, it's less CPU usage, but uh, in TensorFlow Lite, but it, it also results in a higher delay. So the user has to wait up to 400 milliseconds for the system to then start processing. So, uh, and so on, on the left-hand side of this graph, you can see um, this is this is the amount of RAM that's allocated for uh, activations, uh, and then in blue we have in our system for this model. Uh, we only use 26.5 KB of RAM, but uh, in TensorFlow Lite Micro, uh, we need to allocate uh, about 250K. So it's like nine times as much RAM usage. And then also, if you look at uh, MIPS, which is the amount of uh, megahertz of processing power required to, to decode one second of audio, uh, when you compare, even when you're comparing against TensorFlow Lite running at 400 milliseconds, uh, we use, we use uh, about 48 MIPS for one second of audio, uh, at, and that's, that's giving an output, inter output interval, output every 80 milliseconds, For TensorFlow, even at 400 millisecond intervals, it's still over three times uh, as much processing power required. So as a result, uh, since we're able to, to um, have use less memory and less use CPU power, it means we can run uh, more powerful models and also run them uh, on, uh, on uh, with using less power on, on low, more low power devices. Also, because we're, we're doing uh, only including the, the uh, parts of the code that we need, uh, this results in, in a smaller code, code size so we can fit this into a uh, limited flash memory. Uh, and, and because we're doing streaming uh, processing, that it reduces the latency and delay when uh, doing real-time operations. So the, the end result of this is to have um, 
a cheaper but more but still a equally effective device design. Uh, so now, I guess I can hand it back to uh, to Vikrant, who wants to. So Sam uh, and Vikrant, do we want to take a few more questions before we move to the move on to the demo? Sure. Cool. Thank you. So uh, one question from the audience. Uh, so as you add more commands to your model, uh, does it reduce the latency and increase the model size significantly? Uh, the adding more commands does increase the size of the uh, uh, size of the model, but it does not have an impact on the uh, latency that much uh, because we take that into account uh, then making sure that the models are working in real time or near real time, even when uh, there is a high, uh, the large number of comments. And in fact, the, the next demo that I wanted to show kind of speaks to that effect. It, it has up to 500 different intents. Uh, and then we say intents uh, because the, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's say the turn on the light, right? A person wants to turn on the light in the room. So if they can say, turn on the light, they can say, switch the light on. They could say, oh, it's too dark in here, things like this. And at Fluent AI, we don't count these as separate things. We look at this overall as the one intent of the user. So 500 intents really means that in terms of the vocabulary, in terms of the commands that the person could say in their natural language, that it can be very large. I think it was about when we expanded it to, to some variations, it was about 13,000 commands. And for, for that, for comparison, for that particular model, we were still using uh, about 100 something kilobyte of RAM, I think 128 or, or a little bit more. Uh, and the flash storage was about 1.3 megabyte in this case, compared to the earlier case where the flash storage was only about 550 kilobyte for the 100 intents. So it, 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 it had some impact on the flash storage, but that's it. Okay, so another question just came in. Uh, in your footprint table, you refer to storage. By that, do you mean storage of the NN weights? Right, so uh, in our table, we had uh, flash storage. That is uh, just not just the weights, it's actually weights plus uh, also the library, some of the, uh, some of the code that takes care of basically taking the, taking the weights, doing the calculations on them, the neural network architecture and all those things. So, every, so we talk, talk about the total of it. Uh, weights is a part of it. The neural network is become, becomes a part of it. Great. So you mentioned in your solution, you integrated with Synthesis DSP and uh, Synthesis NN. So how much performance uptake were you able to observe with Synthesis integration? Right, so that's a good question. So we actually, uh, um, there are, if you look at the alternatives, uh, it could be things like Eigen or some other open source uh, uh, things available, but they are not optimized for uh, for particular platforms, the advantage of using Simsys is that it it has a number of algorithm, a number of routines have been optimized in assembly code for the targeted at specific uh, uh, ARM platforms. Uh, so the table that Sam showed for with respect to the doing a comparison between Fluent Micro Core and uh, TensorFlow Micro, TensorFlow Lite Micro, uh, that speaks to uh, partly speaks to the advantages that we get by using uh, CMCs as well. So there's a number of optimization that Fluent team has done on top of CMCs, but there's also a, a number of optimizations that we, we get because we're using CMCs. Okay, so another question. Uh, does your micro core work on micro NPUs? How would the architecture involve from here? Right, so that's a, a, it's a very good question. Um, and as we see how, uh, so NPU's neural processing units is the next generation of hardware platforms. And as we see how this AI, as the AI is evolving more and more, and as AI is finding more and more use in different kinds of applications, we see a number of different companies coming with NPUs. Uh, at Fluent AI, we, uh, we, we have been working with uh, a number of AN NPU partners, including ARM and optimizing microcore to take advantage of these vector accelerators that exist in these NPUs uh, so that microcore can be even further optimized when running on those targeted platforms. A lot of that work is uh, in development 
but we are taking the approach of sort of the, the, like relying on expertise that we get from ARM, but at the same time designing something that is very easily uh, is 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 very easily able to go on a variety of different platforms. So it, the, the evolution is still transient, uh, but it is an interesting place to be right now, definitely. Cool. Yeah, I know you mentioned that currently you train the model on a GPU uh, machine. So do you expect one day you will be able to retrain the command on the controller itself, probably using transfer learning or other techniques? So it's a, yeah, uh, very good question. Actually, again, um, we do have uh, some parts of our uh, technology that are able to be trained or tuned on the uh, uh, on small platforms themselves. Uh, and one, one example of that is the uh, my, uh, user trainable wake word. Uh, we have uh, some user trainable wake word examples that you could just speak to the device three and four times and then it learns directly on the device. Uh, another example is the personalization aspect where it can learn on the device. And transfer learning definitely is uh, one part of it, but there's a few other uh, uh, different components or innovations that go into it. Uh, and Sam uh, and team, uh, part of our machine, Sam is part of our machine learning team and other members of the machine learning team have done a lot of good work in making sure that we can remain, we can do these things that are typically done on GPUs to, on these microcontrollers. Uh, just to qualify, it is not training a full speech recognition model on the GPU, it's just adapting a pre-trained model and transfer learning kind of speaks to, to that part, right? So, yeah. Cool, thank you. Now uh, I will hand over back to you for the demo. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this particular demo is, uh, it's basically the, the demos we showed so far were more targeted at uh, devices with a handful of commands. And then we wanted to show one more demo. This one is uh, a video uh, uh, that is basically uh, can do a more complex smart home, complete smart home uh, use case. I will have to uh, just allow me to switch my microphone for a second and then I'll share my, uh, let me share my screen. Um, so this one is running also on a, a ST board, uh, but this is an ARM Cortex M7. The processor I believe is running at 216 megahertz and we are using about 1.3 megabyte of storage. Again, three parallel wake words uh, and uh, these three parallel wake words we always use to, to demonstrate the uh, efficiency of our technology. And it can do up to 500 different intents on, on the device. Uh, we've used, uh, the, co the commands in this one are a bit more complex, like sort of setting, uh, setting the temperature in a particular room in a house or things like this. So we've used a combination of GIFs to demonstrate uh, various, uh, various things. Computer, turn on the TV. Alexa, what's on TV? Computer, I need volume. Hey Google, lower the volume. Alexa, TV off. Hey Google, make it colder in the bedroom. Alexa, lower temperature in the kitchen. Computer, warmer in bathroom. Alexa, open the curtains. Computer, play pop music. Computer, play my favorites. Alexa, fan speed high. Hey Google, low fan speed. Alexa, switch on dining room lights. Computer, turn off all lights. So um, as this particular demo basically we saw it's uh, it it is a larger vocabulary demo doing a number of different things in, in the house. Uh, and obviously all of our demos, everything is running offline on the device itself. So whether that's an M4, M M7 or M33, 100% of the processing is on the device. Uh, we use the word, uh, the key keywords 
Alexa and Google and computer just for demonstration purposes uh, there. So that, cons that covers all the demos we had uh, to show uh, right now. Uh, now we'll uh, go back to the uh, question and answers. Yeah, so probably uh, we can, we have time to ask a few more questions. So I think one of the concerns from our audience is still power consumption. Yeah, how much power is consumed on the device when it's listening? So uh, how do you think a typical battery can last in your solution? Right, so it's a, it's a good question. Uh, the power consumption depends on, uh, it's a combination of software, but also the hardware, right? So some of the implementations can be very efficient. So for example, we work, one of the partner companies that we work with is uh, Ambic Micro, and uh, they design these really low power Cortex M4 solutions uh, with the, some of the lowest power consumption in industry. And uh, we have a couple of customers that are we're working on together for devices that are powered by uh, these, uh, these portable batteries. Uh, so the exact power envelope of the, uh, uh, let's say Apollo 3 is one of the uh, processor by them. Uh, I, I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it's six micro ampere per 10 megahertz, but uh, I'll have to look up. The, it's available on, on their website, that information. Cool. And on that board, uh, and that is when the processor is running at full power and, and our wakeward system typically runs at 50% uh, uh, of the cycle or on that board or even less. Yeah, uh, we have some other questions about noise cancellation. I think mm -hmm. Rankar, you already addressed this in the Q&A, but I just want to repeat it again so all the audience will be able to learn from this. So apparently noise cancellation is a big challenge that a lot of uh, voice recognition or speech recognition practitioners are facing right now. So how do you avoid this in your solution? Yeah, so for, for noise is often one of the biggest issues when it comes to uh, speech recognition. And there's a number of things that we have to, uh, a number of things we have to keep in mind when designing a speech user interface, if you were to call it, like for a speech device that uh, the user will be speaking to. Uh, so what we are doing at Fluent is focusing on the backend part, if, you, if I were to call it, which is the speech recognition engine where the, you have to train the model in a way that they are more noise robust or they are noise robust or they're able to handle uh, noise robust uh, or different types of noises on the device. At Fluent AI, uh, our direct speech to intent models are more noise robust, they're more optimized end to end than conventional uh, ASR based systems. So we do get certain advantages just because of the uh, unique algorithms we use. Um, that's part one. However, even we go beyond that, and uh, we go beyond that and specifically train models uh, with a variety of different noise conditions using a set, set of data augmentation algorithms to improve their accuracy in noise. So that, but that is only part of the equation. Then, in front of that, uh, in a good device design, there has to be a speech front end. It's basically a set of signal processing algorithms that takes the incoming speech either from one or ideally multiple microphones and performs a number of different noise removal or de-reverberation set of techniques to clean the speech. And this, this is the speech that eventually then goes into the uh, speech recognizer. So we at Fluent AI work closely with a number of uh, uh, speech front end providers uh, so that together we can provide a complete solution to the customer. Uh, we received another very interesting question about security. So when your device is in a continuously listening mode, how do you ensure security and protect uh, from the device it's being hacked? Right, so, so most one inter uh, key thing about our technology is that everything is running on the device, right? So the concern that would, one would have typically for uh, with a uh, let's say virtual assistant uh, could be that all the information is being streamed to some cloud, cloud server or somebody else from outside the uh, 
premises could be listening in on the device. But for, for us, everything happens directly on the device and it, nothing basically goes beyond the device. So that in itself helps preserve privacy of the user and also to some, ex, uh, some extent provides a, a layer of security. Beyond that, we are uh, at Fluent have been working on speaker recognition technology as well, where even though the device is always listening, it will only respond to a select uh, number of speakers and not everybody. And that provides another layer of, uh, sec that could provide another layer of security. This is a uh, work in uh, progress right now. We hope to be able to announce this sometime uh, like as a complete product sometime this year. Great. So uh, I think you also mentioned that your solution is compatible with M4, M7, M33, those type of uh, Cortex-M microcontrollers. So what's the minimum requirement for running your solution, device requirement? Yeah, so uh, right now, most of our, uh, if it is just running Fluent Solution alone, uh, we can run uh, with certain optimizations. We can run on as low as uh, uh, 30 megahertz on a Cortex M4, which is one of the lowest power uh, out of these uh, three architectures uh, that you mentioned. Uh, so 30 megahertz in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the, the CPU clock cycle and uh, about 100 kilobyte of RAM, 128 kilobyte of RAM that covers both the wake word as well as uh, uh, about 30 to 50 different intents on the device. Cool. Yeah, I think we have covered most questions from our audience at this time. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Or if you want to do an open mic session, we can uh, unmute you. Uh, just raise your hand and we can unmute you if you want to ask any questions live. Okay, I think, uh, let me see here. We have a question actually from uh, Ido Gus. We can unmute him. Um, cool. Okay, so. Um, Hi, hello. It was a very interesting presentation, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you can uh, shed some light about the uh, customization process for the end user. And uh, is it relevant for the uh, wake wall detection or the SLU? Yeah, thank yeah. you. Uh, so the, the customization, you, you mean the personalization part, I, I, I presume you meant the personalization part uh, that uh, we, we talked about. Um, so typically, because we are a, we, we supply to OEMs and ODMs, we work with them to design an interface where the user could interact with the device and provide certain kind of feedback. Uh, for a wakeward user trainable wakeward system, uh, it is really simply pressing, uh, let's say a button twice, uh, pressing a button and saying, hey Bob, two, three times, three, three times ideally. And then the device learns, the system learns that on the device and is able to um, start listening for that as the wake word. For the personalization one, uh, the UX or the user experience is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more involved because it has to take into account uh, 